hold hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to the Ghost Story Pass. Hello, this is Luke Law, a companion piece to the Ghost Story Guys podcast where I share some of the folklore surrounding the stories that the main episodes tell. Today I'll be taking another look at fairy folklore as a companion piece to episode 26 in the land of the fairy, Digression is King, as well as now Luke Law episode 4, The Good Folk. Sorry about the random break everyone, I got a double whammy, flu-like virus and infected abscess on my shoulder. It's been a process. A process lacking in sleep with many horrible details I shall spare you. I'm much better now, though. So what we're doing is we're making an extra big Luke Law now, plus a bonus Halloween episode for later. For this episode, we're going to look at a particular kind of furry. We're going down to the water for a bad time and looking at stories of the otherworldly creatures that can be found there if you're unlucky. I'll start this one off with the Kelpie. They also have a Scottish name, Ak Ish K, which simply means water horse, and they have equivalents across Ireland and Wales. They can appear as humans on land, they can be tricksters, but they can also be downright terrifying nightmare fuel. I'm not sure if this is all Kelpies, but it sure as heck some of them. They can seal a person in place if you're touched by one. Climb on one, or just place your hand on one, and then you become stuck to the Kelpie unless it chooses to let you go. And there are plenty of stories where they choose not to do that and instead haul off screaming children to the bottom of their associated lake, lock, or swamp where the Kelpie can breathe and the children cannot. Yeah, Kelpie stories can get pretty dark. There's a traditional story of ten children playing near the water when a horse trots over to them and stands still so they can climb upon its back. The children are delighted as they all climb on, the horse growing longer and longer so there's always space for another child to climb up. Soon, nine children are laughing on the back of their magic horse, encouraging the tenth child to jump up with them and play. But the tenth child is suspicious of the sudden appearance of a magic horse, as you bloody should be, and they reach out to stroke the horse with just the fingertip. Where the tip of their finger touches the horse, it becomes stuck fast. All ten children, trapped, the kelpie heads out into the water and, as soon as it is deep enough, starts to head under the water with its meal. The tenth child manages to either cut the finger off with a knife or else tear it off depending on which version of the story you hear, leaving the nine children who climbed on its back screaming in terror, trapped as they are dragged off to their doom. Yep. Kelpies! There are other stories of Kelpies though. They're not always hungry for the flesh of children. Sometimes they're dangerously horny and pursue human women. I shan't be sharing one of them. Bonus nightmare fuel, there are stories of Kelpies that can hide in the form of a suspiciously abandoned boat. The shape-shifting git can stick the curious to it just as securely in this form, and then it's bad times at the bottom of the lake for you, as your sweet new boat you found gives a triumphant shriek and turns into a hungry water horse. For everyone thinking the British Isles is clearly onto furries as Australia is to nature, and just avoiding the place will keep you safe, I have some bad news for you. The United States has Kelpie stories too, so, just assume any suspicious horse in the swamp is not a horse you should play with. Report it to professionals to help. You will either be better suited to help a stray horse, anyway, or else get kelp at a kelpie instead of you, so win-win. For you, not the poor sod who went to help the horse and got eaten by a kelpie instead. But better them than you. Next is one of the stories I would have cut from a normal-sized Luke Law, but we're making up for lost time here. A nice and nasty furry bogeyman from my home county of Lancashire, Jenny Greenteeth. Also known as Wicked Jenny, she's one of a variety of river hags who vary from region to region, most likely a shared parable to keep kids away from dangerous water full of entangling weeds, although I saw one source suggesting that figos such as Pego Nell or the Grindylow may have their roots in very old memories of sacrificial practices. Jenny, or Ginny Greenteeth, was my local version. She's a rather simple bogeyman, either a furry creature or for some stories the ghost of a witch. Children playing in still waters thinking they are safe will be sneaked up upon. Her fingers will wrap around their legs like the tickling of the duckweed that can sometimes be called Jenny Greenteeth weeds, and before they know it, she's got an unbreakable hold on their legs and is yanking the unsuspecting child down to their doom. What's easily the best known water fairy, and therefore the has to take seriously at this point in time, has got to be mermaids. Even outside of Disney's Little Mermaid, the pretty ubiquitous. I doubt anyone over the age of two needs them explaining. They're a pretty whimsical figure in pop culture these days, 
They only really need to chill out looking fabulous to get by, and it's a niche they share pretty comfortably with unicorns. While mermaids never seem to be the worst of otherworldly creatures, there's obviously more of an edge to the older stories. Hans Christian Andersen's original The Little Mermaid is one heck of a down that doesn't go well for poor Ariel. It's got heavy undertones of not making deals with the devil for its moral centre. Every step she took on land was like stepping on knives. The sea witch wins by using the mermaid's stolen voice to get with the prince. And the little mermaid herself, in the end, stumbles to her doom, destroyed by the sea she was no longer able to return to. She did win an afterlife for being pure, though. She got to become an earth spirit who watches over people after the original tale had established mermaids have no soul, so they only get oblivion should they die. Truly a heartwarming fairy tale for the ages. It did at least work as a whole story, though. Most mermaid folklore just sees them as vapid beauties that men chase. Sometimes to their doom and sometimes to the capture of the mermaid. If you could steal a personal possession of theirs, like a comb, you could force the mermaid to come live with you in human form, and she was bound to be with you until she found her possession, at which point she could flee back to the sea. I don't really see what moral they were shooting for there, except maybe mermaids should avoid human men just in case one of them is a weirdo. There's a slight counterculture interpretation of mermaids I've seen popping up on social media lately that focuses on mermaids being predators of men, which I've been enjoying immensely. Some of the art and comics people have been coming up with about man-eating mermaids has been brilliant, and there are even a few recent B-movies popping up about this. Another less terrifying fake creature, but probably still something you should leave well alone, are selkies. Selkies are similar to mermaids in behaviour, but they're more of a kind of shapeshifter. They can pass for human, or they can put on their seal skin and you wouldn't know them from a regular version of that animal. Similar to stealing a mermaid's possession in some stories, men would steal the seal skin of a selkie woman to force her to be their wife, since selkies are known to make great wives. But there are also less creepy stories of selkies who choose to be with a man. The husband would be none the wiser unless he caught his wife sneaking out for a swim. While it seems possible to capture a selkie, and there are otherwise pleasant but bittersweet stories of love between selkies and humans that end tragically, don't forget that they are still fey. There are no pushovers and should be left well alone. There's a story of one selkie in the Danish Faroe Islands called Copaconan. It follows a basic selkie story up to a point. She was kept as a wife until she found her skin and escaped. But it takes a darker turn from there. The islanders were organising a seal hunt and Copaconan came to her former husband in a dream, pointing out a particular bull seal and two pups which were her selkie husband and children, begging him to spur them. Ignoring her, he killed any seal he came across, resulting in their deaths. That night, Copaconan appeared at the village to curse all the menfolk to die either from drowning or from falling off the cliffs, until such a time there would be enough dead to join hands forming a ring around the island. I kind of want to go and see a statue now. There really is a worrying amount of folklore centred on people trying to coerce a furry creature into becoming a wife, and I'm starting to feel the humans are the villains of those stories, which then makes me worry whose stories these are. Talking mermaids and selkies, there's a little bit of overlap with a couple of other things I have some small insights to share. Veering into Brothers Grimm mainland Germanic fairy tale, with the parallel of trying to grab a wife via magical means, we've got the Swan Princess fairy tales, I only bring this one up because of a bloody brilliant take on this. A fascinating absurdist twist I found online a while back. I think it was one of the Tumblr fandom discussions that get screen capped and shared around. Everyone assumes a swan princess will be a dainty meek one, easily captured and held as an unwilling bride. I want you to think about swans for a moment. Honking great doom beasts that can rage murder other animals if they get annoyed, and quite easily snap a grown man's arm with a crack of one of their overdeveloped wings. Does any of that sound meek and frail? Any swan that polymorphed into a princess would turn an Amazon warrior's head, standing at least six foot tall and that wider getting pure muscle. You aren't stealing a swan princess, you're hoping she goes easy on you. This would be a princess who can bend metal and wouldn't need shape-shifting brothers to deal with you despite what some fairy tales may suggest. Heading down to the warmer bits of Europe, since we've already mentioned mermaids, we can wrap around to the tale of the sirens. Most pop folklore is happy to depict them as sort of a singing mermaid who can entrance people with their voices. But a standout tidbit of speculation I saw recently may mean they aren't luring men to their deaths via libido, as easy as that usually would be, and despite how that lines up with poor mermaids and sulkies being hunted for wives in a bit of karmic retribution. 
The translation may instead mean something else entirely. Instead of attractive fish women laying down a honey trap, there's a good chance what the sirens tempted people with in the original version of the tales is knowledge. The siren call was irresistible information, secrets of the world that would cause people to dash themselves to death upon the rocks desperate for more. I think that's pretty compelling over the idea that temptingly hot half women can sing you to your dumbass doom. So while we're doing a jumbo-sized Luke Lord that includes mermaids, I thought this would fit, even though I don't tend to dabble with Greek mythology. Incidentally, my favourite ever potential mistranslation in folklore is the slipper in Cinderella. There's a very good chance that the original slipper wasn't glass and was instead squirrel skin. Squirrel slipper doesn't quite have the same ring to it as glass, though, so I don't see the alternative making much of a comeback. While we're in the Mediterranean, we've got a nicer water horse to take note of. The Hippocampus. Not the bit in your brain named after him, the literal horsefish that's wild and likely to kick your head in. But that's just standard operating procedure for a wild horse. Whereas a Kelpie is a dangerous, child-hungry fey monster, this is more of a funky cryptid. I thought I'd include them as water-based furry horse disambiguation. Are you in a marsh with your strange new friend, being smothered by an aura of malice? No touchy, evil water horsey. Are you in a warm ocean? Feel free to yell out that Poseidon has a cool horse, and then don't touch it anyway because it's strong and your head is made out of crushable skull. Just leave furry stuff alone is the good rule of thumb here. That's all for Luke Law this time. I'll be back in a month with another episode. I feel much better and you should be able to count on that. Follow us on Patreon get this early, so check out patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys for that, and plenty more cool stuff if you want to support us directly. But as ever, just listening is plenty of support in and of itself. I hope you like my companion show, and please feel free to reach out either to the show or myself via email or social media if you have any questions, feedback, or requests for Luke Law. The show email is ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. I'm Luke Greensmith on both Twitter and Facebook. We also have a very active Instagram full of all kinds of things we've been finding around the internet, and even occasionally news and peeks behind the scenes. Goodbye for now. 